Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to, to the uh, Athenaeum on behalf of the Wheeler Centre for, the, for an event that I, for one, have been greatly looking forward to, this conversation with my distinguished guest, Sir Anthony Beevor, a multi-awarded multi -award, multi writer of well over a dozen works, eight of those seminal and groundbreaking accounts of arguably the most terrible event in human history, the Second World War. He is one of the world's most preeminent military historians, has sold millions, literally millions, of books exploring not just the battles in terms of their tactics and from the points of view of generals and commanders, but what it must be like to experience the horror of war for real, ordinary soldiers, men and women and civilians, and other previously unvoiced people. Sir Anthony's visceral yet authoritative words takes the reader, for better or for worse, into the terrible moor of battle. We have read his accounts now of the cataclysms of D-Day, Stalingrad, the fall of Berlin, the Ardennes Offensive and others. Now Sir Anthony has turned his attention to the battle. Many schoolboys, I hope you won't mind me doing this, um, uh, Anthony, schoolboys of my era learned about in the blockbuster film, the accuracy of which I will ask you about later, <laughs> A Bridge Too Far, the doomed 1994 Battle of Arnhem in his new book, and what, what a ripper it is to Arnhem, the Battle for the Bridges. Sir Anthony Beevor, welcome. <laughs> Michael, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent it would illustrate us outlining the battle itself. Uh, you, you, for, for those of you not familiar, we, we, we should just give a, a little pricey of it. The airborne carpet, I'll, I'll, I'll let you just give right. a, well, a uh, potpourri of a summary. After the Battle of Normandy, there was a terrible victory euphoria in the uh, headquarters of the Allied armies. Uh, not just Montgomery, but um, Patton and Bradley even as well. Uh, the, uh, this idea suddenly that the German army was collapsing and the, the war would end by, certainly by Christmas 1944. The trouble was that um, they had misunderstood the <coughs> July plot, the Stauffenberg attempt to blow up Hitler on the 20th of July. They thought that this signified the disintegration of the German army. What other army had tried to blow up their commander-in-chief? Um, mm. But in fact, the failure to kill Hitler actually meant that the Nazis, the SS, had to total grip over the Wehrmacht from that moment onwards, and that the war, in fact, would go on until Hitler himself was dead. But the Allies were sort of convinced that things could be, by a sort of desperate bid, um, could be accelerated, the end could be brought ahead. They charged all the way from the line of the River Seine, all the way to the German frontier, into Belgium, um, and were even close to the Dutch frontier. And this is when the idea for Operation Market Garden, this was Montgomery's idea of dropping what was called the Allied Airborne Army, um, with three and a half uh, airborne divisions, two American, one British, and a Polish independent parachute brigade, uh, in a line from going north from the Belgian frontier all the way to get across the River Rhine at Arnhem, because they felt once they were across the Rhine, the main barrier to Germany, then the war would come to an end very, very rapidly. And like in all questions of warfare, uh, vanity sometimes plays a part, mm -hmm. and vanity certainly played a part, I'm afraid, here. Uh, Monty was determined to get across the Rhine before Patton to his south and Bradley. Uh, so there was a tremendous Anglo-American rivalry in that sense. Um, and he, while doing this, uh, came up with this plan very, very rapidly. And um, they thought that sort of it was a tremendous gamble which would be uh, paid back in, in full. But unfortunately, it turned into a terrible disaster. Well, in fact, early on in the book, Anthony, you make no bones about the outcome by saying it was simply a very, quote, it was simply a very bad plan right from the start and right from the top. If it was a bad plan, was it nonetheless a, a good idea? No. <laughs> it's a very simple answer to that uh -huh. one. Um, the trouble was that Monty, out of... Uh, he, he, he was very narrow-minded, to put it mildly. I, I suggested in the Ardennes book, in fact, that Montgomery had high-functioning Asperger's. Uh, uh -huh. He was unable to listen to anybody else's opinion uh, once he got a, a thought in his head. And what he failed to uh, discuss at all uh, 
uh, was the whole question of how an airborne operation should work. He'd never really been involved, even in the invasion of Sicily, he'd never really been involved in the airborne planning at all. And he'd even been told by General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander, and by his own bosses back in Britain, Field Marshal Brooke and the, War Minist the Ministry of Defense, War Ministry, uh, War Office, he would even been told that all airborne operations had to basically be planned by the air side, i.e. they were the ones who knew the distances, they were the ones who knew what could be achieved. Um, but Montgomery um, derided and despised the Air Force, um, purely because in the invasion of Normandy, uh, our Chief Marshal at Trafford Lee Mallory had suddenly panicked at the last moment, thinking that uh, uh, the airborne operation was going to be a total disaster. And Monty was convinced that, um, to quote Monty, he was a gutless bugger. And um, so Monty was not going to listen to the Air Force, even though he had no experience of airborne operations. And so he thought he would lay down the plan. Um, and then he sent, on the 10th of September, General Boy Browning, who was the mm. British airborne commander, back to England to basically impose Monty's plan on um, the first Allied airborne army. And they had to say, well, I'm sorry, you know, your calculations are wrong. Basically, um, the distance is greater than you realize, so therefore we can't get two gliders behind each airplane. Um, mm. The days are shorter, so we can only get one lift in the first day. Now, this was a key thing because it meant that they would have to leave behind half of the force just to guard the drop zones and the landing zones for the next lift to come in the following day. Totally so, losing the element of surprise. Totally the losing the element of surprise. And also, in the case of the British, um, first airborne, they were eight miles away from their main uh, objective, the bridge at Arnhem, and they had to cross, um, they had to cross the whole city of Arnhem to get to it. Um, it was a very bad plan. And just, I, I, I'd just like to speak to Montgomery a little more. Um, Barry Pitt, uh, one of my early <laughs> favourite historians oh. in his wonderful three-volume account of the Desert War, the Crucible of War, I think he calls it, uh, uh, pays, uh, pays a lot of attention to Montgomery's planning and execution of Alamein to the, po to the point of obsession, uh, even quoting that uh, Montgomery's catch cry was always, show me the plan, show me the plan, and yet Arnhem was seemingly thrown together in, well, little more than a fortnight. What, what had... Uh, 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 are we getting the, 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 the cart before the horse? Was Montgomery not that kind of general to begin with, or, or, or if he was, what had happened to Montgomery in the intervening well, two years since... Um, um, general Bradley, in fact, remarked about the planning for Market Garden um, because Montgomery was famous, especially amongst the Americans, for being overcautious. Uh, yeah. As you say, planning every minor detail and uh, not moving until he was co absolutely convinced that everything was in place. Uh, but in, in fact, the wasn't uh, just uh, in the Desert War wasn't Churchill urging him to go, 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 and, and, and Monty kept holding off, well, saying Monty was right in that particular sense. He was right to insist that they shouldn't go until they were certain of victory. Yeah. Um, but it was other things really which contributed to the victory. But in the case of uh, Market Garden. Um, Monty was so desperate to get ahead of the Americans, to get across the Rhine, um, that he seemed to lose his usual um, particular uh, meticulous attitude to planning. And um, as a result, uh, General Bradley, when he heard about the plan, uh, said afterwards, he said, you know, one would have been even, because Monty was so famous for his caution, uh, said one would have been less surprised if Monty had reeled in drunk, uh, as a, <laughs> a famous teetotaler, Monty was a famous teetotaler, yes. one would have been less surprised if he reeled in drunk, you know, into headquarters, uh, rather than um, see how um, reckless this particular plan was. And when he became aware of that recklessness, and Anthony, is it fair to say that he almost, um, well, not disowned but distanced himself from it. I, I, I say that because in your, in, in the book you talk of a meeting at the waning, in the waning days, an important meeting in the waning days of the battle with Eisenhower and Bradley and so forth, to which Monty did not even show up. He sent his deputy that didn't have any, didn't have even plenipotentiary powers. Um, that's absolutely true. I mean the trouble was that actually Monty realised by then that he, he would be getting some pretty contemptuous looks across the table from Patton and Bradley, uh, because having boasted that sort of this was going to be um, Monty's way of ending the war rapidly, um, it was turning into a disaster, and everybody knew it by that particular stage. 
So Monty kept out of the way. And when it came afterwards to um, the fact that they had to withdraw the remnants of the British First Airborne uh, across the River Rhine, it had been a disaster. They'd gone in, they'd gone in, you know, 11,000 strong, and only about 2,000 came out. Um, Monty um, then tried to pretend that it had been a success. Yes. Um, and uh, Prince Bernhard, the com Dutch commander in chief, uh, said, My country cannot afford another Montgomery victory. <laughs> um, which was, as you might imagine, and in fact, our Chief Marshal Tedder, who was Eisenhower's uh, deputy, <clears throat> was far more devastating. When Monty claimed that it had been a 90% success because they got 90% of the way to Arnhem, which of course meant that that would, had been a total failure, um, yeah. Tedder said, well, one can jump off a cliff uh, with even greater success until the last three inches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not the fall that hurts you, the very sudden no, stop. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, to the battle itself, Anthony, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm sorry to allude to that film, but I know many in the audience may have seen the film uh, um, a, a Bridge Too Far, I think 1977, and it is spectacular. I mean, it, and one thinks of what it must have been like that. It was a Sunday, wasn't it, that the yep. battle opened? Sun, yep. a, a clear, cloud, a, a, a cloudless day just about over Holland. Perfect conditions. Perfect yep. conditions and an armada of, of Stirlings and... Dakotas arrive over mm. this. Uh, it was, the, large, it was the largest airborne operation ever ever mounted. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that was the day that the, the, the British First Air Airborne Division, who had been uh, uh, looked over at D-Day, hadn't they? They had not jumped at D-Day. Is, is that well, correct? no, they they'd been held in in reserve yes, at yes. D-Day. So they were desperate to get into the war. They were they? desperate to get into the war because the poor poor guys. I mean, you know, they'd been stood to uh, altogether. Um, well, some people say 15, some people say 17 times. In some cases, actually getting onto the aircraft ready to take off for one operation after another, which was cancelled at the last moment. And this was particularly during that time when Patton was charging forward, and. Um, and, um, you know, they, the, every single jump which was planned to jump ahead of Patton's troops, Patton's troops had already got there by the time they took yes. off. Yes. So um, from that point of view, yes, they were desperate to go. Uh, they landed, um, not just parachutes, but the air landing brigades, which are basically these big old wooden gliders, and nothing sounds more terrifying of an operation in the Second World War than being a soldier stuck in one of those old balsa wood gliders coming down on and often they crashed and the casualties were terrible. However, they did, they did land, but immediately, and according to your book, they realized that the resistance, the strength of the German resistance was far greater than what, it, what had been anticipated. What had been anticipated of the German resistance in this part of Holland, Anthony? Well, one has got to be, um, there have been a lot of sort of, you know, theories and counter theories. Yes, there were two SS Panzer Divisions, the Hohenstaufen and the Frunsberg SS Panzer Divisions. Who had who been were, in Russia, had they? No, 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 no. They'd they been in Normandy. I mean, they had been in Russia, then they were in Normandy. Uh -huh. They'd been beaten, um, smashed, not quite to a pulp, but uh, really greatly reduced in Normandy. Now, the, uh, through Ultra, they knew they were roughly in the area, these two divisions, but they didn't think that they were going to be that strong, and they weren't in many ways. I mean, sometimes some of the historians have exaggerated how many tanks there were there. In fact, they only had three serviceable tanks, but they had quite a few assault guns. Um, the point was that actually the, it was the very core, uh, the fact that even though they may have been reduced hugely in strength, I mean down to 3,000 per division instead of over 20,000, um, but the point was that with their officers and NCOs, other troops could be uh, grafted onto them uh, and could therefore be very effective in defense. And what we underestimate, uh, and certainly what the planners underestimated was that the Germans were brilliant at reacting from recovering from disaster. General mm -hmm. Sosobowski, the commander of the Polish Brigade, kept mm -hmm. on saying at every one of the briefing sessions, but the Germans, General, the Germans. It was as if the British had totally forgotten the German capacity to recover from defeat and get themselves together and organized. And here it was astonishing. The bulk of the people go on about they dropped on two panzer divisions, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. The, the panzers actually came 
from Germany um, during the night. I mean, the, w as soon as the um, order came through, um, they were loading Panzer uh, Tiger tanks onto railway flats uh, and sending them off through the night. Um, I mean, it was that form of uh, organization, that form of prioritization, I'm afraid neither of which were British virtues. Um, mm -hmm. The Germans certainly um, had them. They were, uh, uh, had this operation been expected in this part of Europe by, by the Germans? Was, we, we, no. we, we say they didn't have the element of surprise, but speak to, to that a little. What, what, was, what, what did they think was going to be happening there? Well, they never expected such a long distance. One remember, you've got to remember, um, they, were, they were trying to drop these paratroopers up to 70 miles, or even in some cases, even 90 miles behind the German lines. Now, nobody had ever done that before. Uh, it was a huge risk from that point of view, and the idea was that the um, 30 Corps of General Horrocks, led by the Guards Armour Division, was going to charge up this yes. one single road. We'll talk to that road in a bit. All the yeah. way, all the way to get to Arnhem. Uh, to relieve the paratroopers on the ground, because the whole point about paratroopers is they've got the advantage of surprise, but they've got no heavy weapons or very few uh, yes. heavy weapons uh, to hold off a major counterattack. Um, and because they thought the German army was in disintegration, they thought that this risk was worth taking. Yes. Uh, that road, <laughs> let's talk to that road that eventually became known as Hell's Highway, That's did right. it not? Uh, astonishingly, this very idea of punching up this road to attack central Holland, um, uh, and, I, I, and you, you, you talk about this in the book, in, the, in the, the Dutch military officers' school, if you had suggested this very plan that the Allies were planning, you would have been sacked from being or seriously demoted. You mean failed immediately. Failed yes. immediately because it was considered such a ludicrous thing to do. This one road, either, either side, was utterly unsuitable for armour. Is that That's correct? right, yes, because you had floodplains so, flood on either, either side, Polderland, as, it was, as the Dutch call it, and you have this one raised road. Uh, now, if you're going to try and send an army with 26,000 vehicles uh, up and a how, single road... How wide? Single, how wide are we talking, th this road? Uh, well, should we say half the width of this theatre? I mean, of this stage? No. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, and so, I mean, and, we, and because it was raised, if tanks had to go off the side, they'd never get back up again. I mean, it was, it was that bad. Um, and the moment they crossed the Dutch frontier, this is within the first five minutes of the advance from the Belgian frontier, um, they were uh, ambushed by German anti-tank guns. Uh, yes. Nine Sherman tanks of the Irish Guards were set ablaze immediately. They had to then bring up dozer tanks to push them off out of the way, you know, down the slide, so that yeah. the advance could continue. But, I mean, that gave you an idea of how easy it was for the Germans to ambush this particular uh, road. Um, now, Montgomery was warned by Dutch officers uh, that it was totally unsuitable, but he still went ahead with it. And this is, of course, his also... Uh, refusal to prioritise the clearing of, of the estuary of the Scheldt River, which was this maze of... I mean, that, that wasn't cleared till, the, till 945, was it? No, no, it was cleared... Uh, well, in the end, the first ships were able to get through by the end of November. But, I mean, um, Admiral Ramsey, who was the uh, chief naval officer of the whole of um, the Allied... Uh, presence in Europe, uh, was Eisenhower's chief naval officer, uh, was furious. I mean, he kept on going on at uh, Montgomery saying, um, it's one thing, we've, you've liberated Antwerp, that's great, uh, which was the largest deep water port in northern Europe at that stage, which they could use. Um, but you haven't liberated the Schelder estuary, and the Germans still had part of their 15th army uh, yes. on it. And um, in the end, by the time it was mainly the Canadians who actually suffered the casualties clearing it, if it had been done straight away, but Monty wanted to get across the Rhine. That was his obsession, and so he thought, well, that can all be sorted out later. And that was a, a very bad mistake. And even Monty, even Monty had to admit that that was a mistake in his memoirs, and he did not admit mistakes, usually. The first part of the book, I, I, I must say that the... the um the machinations between the Western allies at this time. It, to me, it, it almost resembles one of those sort of um, a, a, a dysfunctional boardroom or something like that. These sort of very powerful people who basically detest each other and have completely different visions. Yes, and I think Eisenhower... Uh, achieved an extraordinary amount in keeping this sort of very, these very un, uh, disparate characters together. 
Um, now, one could say that Eisenhower should have put Monty back in his box more firmly at an earlier stage, but uh, anyway, it, you know, I'm afraid that the whole whole situation, um, those sort of rivalries certainly did not help the war effort, and it did more damage um, that and later the Ardennes counteroffensive mm. uh, to allied American or to British American relations um, than any other incident. I yes, think. Uh, and, and to that, just to, 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 j just to um, uh, illustrate just briefly, the British and the Americans had very different ideas of how to push the Germans out of occupied Europe. It was the, because the, 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 it gives, um, Arnhem some kind of context, I think. Um, the Americans had a broad, oh, I'm getting wrong, but the Americans had a very broad stroke, a, 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 a broad push idea, and the British had a very sort of a specific um, um, pushing into various German strongholds and then doing it that way. Is, is that roughly correct? Yes, um, the, 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 the trouble went back. I mean, all, the whole of British strategy in the Second World War was totally different to the American one. Mm. British strategy basically went back to the 18th century. Um, Churchill, <laughs> no, seriously. Churchill, uh, and then one's got to understand, Britain as an island nation with a relatively very small population um, was never going to get itself involved in a major continental war for, straight off. Uh, it used the advantage of the power of the Royal Navy to wear down their enemies, particularly in the Mediterranean, but a, a, what was called a peripheral strategy, before they would then defeat the enemy, whether the French, usually the French, or later on, say, the Germans, uh, on the continent of Europe. The Americans, on the other hand, had a continental strategy, which goes back, really, to the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. They believed it was hard pounding with major clashes between the major armies on the European continent. And that was why they always wanted to have D-Day. Churchill never wanted to do the cross-channel invasion. Churchill always wanted to come up through Italy. Um, and he tried that idea in the first war and it didn't quite... <laughs> well, or something, true. something similar. I think there was something called Gallipoli, which yes. you might have heard of, which um, <laughs> Churchill had uh, certainly... Um, but it, would, it had always been the idea, in a way, was to attack north from the Mediterranean um, and sort of, if you like, encircle your enemy in that particular way, rather than launch head on. And um, this is what he was hoping to do through Italy, because he was afraid, of course, of the Soviet advance from the east and the Soviet occupation of the whole of Central Europe. And by going up through Italy, he thought that they could then launch the major attack uh, through, northern, through northeastern Italy, through the Ljubljana Gap. Uh -huh. Actually, this would have been a crazy idea because the terrain, I mean, it's bad enough fighting the way up the length of yes. Italy, the Alpine lines, yes. um, and it would have been even worse. But this was very much sort of his vision. Um, the Americans rightly um, prevented that because by then they were in the driving seat. Uh, yeah. The British were very much the junior partners. Um, and that's why Churchill had no option, especially after the Tehran conference at the end of 1943, uh, to agree to the pressure from Stalin above all, who was demanding an attack through Northern Europe. Um, and that was why we had D-Day, and that's why we had the advance into Belgium and um, across uh, into, into Germany in the West, from the West. Um, now, the real problem was that the British, uh, Monty particularly, felt that um, he should lead the attack. And in a way, this was sort of a desperate attempt to regain British prestige. Um, and Monty to become, once again, the land forces commander, which he had been at the time of D-Day and was up until the 1st of September. 1944, when Eisenhower took over. So, as which, I say, which he did not take very well at all. Which he didn't take well. Uh, mm. And um, Churchill, the trouble was, the British press played a terrible part in all of this uh, because they <laughs> felt that sort of, you know, Monty was our hero, we want to support our hero, um, and the Americans are trying to do him down. Uh, mm. And this created very, very bad relations with the Americans. And it was the reason also why Churchill felt that Montgomery should be promoted to field marshal, yes. which was actually a five star. Gen five star rank when Eisenhower only had four stars. So you can imagine how, um, how really um, uh, angry the uh, American generals were. I mean, you should read Patton's diary on the subject of yeah. uh, what he thought of that. Tell it, me, what, is this, what does it say? Oh, he said, this field marshal thing, it really makes you sick. I mean, you know, he and, he and Brad were absolutely mad and all the rest of it, and one can, under one can understand it. Mm. Uh, mm. It was a bad move, it was. Back to the battle, this, on this, this sunny day we talked about 
the sunny Sunday when there's thousands of uh, uh, British, and the Americans landed the same day, the 80, oh, yeah. 82nd. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the, I should have said, in fact, uh, the whole point was to line, the, if you like, to roll this carpet. This was uh, yes. Browning's phrase, this airborne carpet. Uh, so you had the 101st Airborne dropping at Eindhoven, uh, just north of the, um, of the frontier, the Dutch frontier, uh, and then the 82nd Airborne under General Jim Gavin at yes. uh, Nijmegen, yes. and then the British 1st Airborne. And the idea was that you knew you charged up through that particular line, joined up the dots. And, and to hold, hold the bridges before the Germans could And hold them, the bridges yes. before the Germans could counterattack. Yes, and from then you could sort of push into the, well, the industrial across the Rhine and you're into yes. the industrial heart of Germany. Yeah. So <laughs> what is astonishing is that they didn't land on top of the bridges. They had to trek. They had to hike, basically, for miles and miles. Why, why was well, that? Well, this was because the American Air Force uh, said the bridges were too well uh, guarded by um, flak, by anti-aircraft um, guns, um, uh, and said that they, should, uh, they could only land um, a distance away. What, what distance are we talking about? We're talking about over eight miles. <laughs> um, so, I mean, by the time that you've actually got out of your aircraft, yes. either landed by parachute, assembled your battalions, and marched them off, uh, you know, that can take quite a long time in itself. And these, it? are, these are men carrying their own body weight again in equipment. Yep. And of course, in the then they had to get the the jeeps out of the uh, gliders, most of which had crash landed, and therefore had to be sort of almost pulled apart so that you could actually get the jeep out and the anti tank guns out and all the rest of it. So that all of that took time, and in fact, it is certainly true that the um, they weren't as fast off the mark as they should have been. But where they were just again very unlucky was that there was this training battalion of SS. Yes. commanded by um, one very ambitious the SS trick, officer um, called Sepp uh, Kraft. And um, he was able just to slow them down enough uh, to give time for the other SS uh, divisions to send in their men to create this blocking line to prevent them getting through to Arnhem, let alone getting through anywhere close to the bridge. And there was only one battalion which managed to slip through along the bank of the Rhine. Um, and hold one end of the bridge. And hold one end of the bridge. And, they and of course, never got to the other side, did and they? And they never got to the other side. And this was for those of you who've seen the film. Um, but I was, no, no, no. I mean, the film, to be honest, I mean, to be fair <laughs> as well, is, is a lot better than many um, Second World War movies. I mean, there have been some real <laughs> shockers. Um, <laughs> but I was very amused in the American archives um, to find that um, there were some furious letters from Major Julian Cook. And Julian Cook was one, the one played by Robert Redford in the film, yes. um, who led, I mean, one of the most bravest incidents of the whole of the Second World War of paddling in daylight across the widest river in Europe at the time. This is the Vaal, um, in these little canvas boats um, against absolute devastating fire uh, with huge casualties. But they did it, and they won it. Anyway, here in this um, American archive, I found this thing about um, uh, Major Cook complaining bitterly about being played by Robert Redford. I'd thought most, <laughs> I'd have thought most men would have been rather flattered, but anyway, there we go. <laughs> the battle was, as, as you describe in the book, uh, I mean, this is where the film fails, because the, this battle was incredibly bloody yes. and incredibly brutal. The, your descriptions of, of particularly the Americans taking the town of Nijmegen and holding it well, they actually continued to hold it, didn't they? That, that was one of the yep. enduring victories, if you will, of mm. the battle. They actually held it. But it was brutal. Oh, and it was. I mean, the, the Americans were extremely brutal in ways that, I mean, often you're reading some of the accounts of what they did to, to the German prisoners. I mean, shooting unarmed German surrenders, uh, prisoners mm. with, with white flags. You expect that behaviour to be done by the Germans, not the Americans. Well, I mean, I mean the, the, there was a certain amount of that even in Normandy. Uh, the American paratroopers were conditioned in their training to be utterly aggressive. In fact, there was a British guards officer who watched them in action, who said, I think they're fed either on dynamite or raw meat. Um, and I mean, when they got to, um, I mean, I describe how, and it's fascinating from these, some of these personal accounts, of the way that having crossed this river, I mean, in what must have been one of the most terrifying moments of yes. the whole of the Second World yes. War, Having survived that crossing, they then had this metamorphosis from total fear to total self-confidence. And they surge forward with bloodlust. 
And what those involved in it actually describe their own feelings. I mean, that they are now fired up on such adrenaline that they just can't stop shooting. They shoot down 267 men trying to surrender uh, on the railway bridge. They're captured on, they're, they're sort of trapped there on both sides. Um, it was a total massacre. I mean, any of these boys, some of them, I mean, um, certainly, for example, you know, some of the more senior officers weren't necessarily shooting those trying to surrender. Um, but I mean, many of them were just gunning down anybody, even as they stuck up their hands or anything like that. And I mean, the British were pretty shocked by that. I mean, come on, the British, all armies, and we know this in the First World War too, I mean, all armies shoot far more prisoners than one realizes. And on the whole, I think military historians in the past have been guilty about trying to cover this up, especially from when they're talking about the shooting of the, by their own mm. countrymen. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there are moments when one sees it gets really out of control. It happened in the Ardennes too. I mean, in, in the Ardennes, uh, the Americans went on about the Malmedy massacre where the SS uh, massacred a whole lot of Americans. American prisoners who'd surrendered, um, but they had their own, but they covered that one up um, almost as bad. Uh, over 60 were simply gunned, really? down, gunned down, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and there were many other incidents, but that was partly because they felt it justified after the SS killing their guys, their, Malmedy, their yes. count comrades yeah. at Malmedy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's always going to be this vicious circle. I mean, the Canadians also in Normandy uh, not have killed a lot, but that was after 70 of their men, including one company commander, had been beheaded by the SS. Mm. Um, you're, you, will get these, you will get these incidents. Um, it depends very much on the officers keeping control and the NCOs keeping control. Um, but sometimes, you know, the bloodlust will be there, and it's very, very hard to make moral judgments in retrospect uh, when you have not actually been in those conditions. <coughs> the battle went on for the next, was it, was it 10 days in all? All together, yes, nine all days ten, or so. 10 days. Yeah, yeah. And the accounts in the second half of the book, Anthony, are so are, are extraordinary. It really is just some moments of extraordinary bravery when the British and Americans realised that there was simply no way that they were going to win and that they had the um, tail, the scales had tipped against them, it seems, quite early in the battle. And whether they knew it or not, it did not stop their fighting spirit. Oh, goodness, no. And I think that... Um what well, one's always seen, I think, certainly when one talks about the British, is that on the whole they've always been much better in defence than in attack. Um, mm -hmm. yes. I think the American paratroopers were extremely good in attack too. Um, that was their advantage, but that was also the way that they had, to a certain degree, been sort of brainwashed in their, uh, in their training. I mean, the American para paratrooper training was incredible in that particular way, and yes. it did produce this sort of bloodlust. Um, but there was no doubt about the bravery um, and the courage but not just of the soldiers, it was also the civilians. Yes, I mean, so the way I, that the Dutch civilians that. did everything they could of going out into the street under fire to pull the wounded into their houses to yes. look after them. And then the Germans um, executing a, uh, quite a few of them during the course of the battle. Um, and this is where I think it leads on to one of the greatest tragedy of all, which is the failure to win that particular battle means that the Dutch civilians, who have done so much to help the Allies, whether it was a question of carrying their supplies, whether it was even digging trenches for them, um, I mean, they came forward to offer help in every possible way. And the way that the um, Dutch railwomen stopped the trains from bringing German supplies yes, and yes. so forth, and they were often executed as a result. So, I mean, the German revenge afterwards was terrifying. Well, this is what I didn't realize. I had no idea that the whole, the entire 150 odd thousand uh, uh, inhabitants of the city of Arnhem, which is a big town, it was mm. a big town, were expelled. Yes. To a man, woman and child in the, I mean, uh, um, much of this city had been shattered, of course. And then it was looted comprehensively. Yes. And yes. then and then, then often burnt down. I mean, what was for me was one of the most moving things of all was that the mayor of Arnhem, uh, Ahmed Markouf, um, insisted on having the launch of my book in the Dutch edition, which was the very first one to come out, uh -huh. in, in, the, in the, the cathedral, the Grotekerk of St. Eusebius. Um, and there you have around on the walls the pictures of how it had been destroyed during the fighting. And there uh, it all has been completely restored and rebuilt.
Um, and I think still for the people of, and particularly this year, it's the 75th anniversary. Yes. Um, the way that the airborne veterans will be welcomed back, considering what the Dutch suffered as a result of this disastrous operation, um, I think it's one of the most gen generous acts of the whole of the Second World War. Indeed, and because they had taken the risk of when, the, when their liberators arrived, mm. of helping them, and then it failed, so the repu re retribution uh, towards those who had been even suspected of helping the British or the Americans was, was, was terrible. Oh, they lost everything. Yes. I mean, you know, that not only with our houses looted systematically, uh, the, the Nazi justification was uh, this was this was repayment for all of the bombing of Germany by the Royal Air yes, Force and yes, the US yes. Air Force. Um, and so they, they, they stripped the houses um, and um, then set them on fire. And um, so Arnhem had to be completely, completely rebuilt. You uh, nonetheless talk of some peculiar, sometimes bizarre moments of chivalry, nonetheless, between the English and the Germans. Um, uh, well, the, I think the, it was not so much chivalry. In the case the of the Waffen SS, um, I think they were trying to clean up their um, reputation. I mean, uh -huh. so that, that they, what they wanted to show was that even though uh, they were notorious for the war crimes that they had committed in, on the Eastern Front yeah. particularly, um, they wanted to show how ritalic, how, how chivalrous, you're quite right, um, they were uh, on the Western Front. Um, and in fact, it was interesting that the commander uh, of the Hohenstaufen, Harzer, wrote to Urquhart, the commander of the British 1st Airborne Division, uh, from his prison camp um, to say, will you surely, we are being investigated as members of the SS, we are yes, being investigated yes. as war criminals, uh, will you not give us a uh, testimonial to, show, to <laughs> say how well we treated you when we beat you at Arnhem? And he didn't. He didn't. Yes, yes, yes. But, uh, oh, oh, but not just one, but several moments of um, um, British medical officers holding a Red Cross flag and crossing openly into the German lines and being mm. received and able to... Th th there was even a truce that lasted for four hours that, that they didn't even tell Hitler about because they know he would have been enraged. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Actually, the, I mean, the SS Corps commander... Uh, Obergruppenführer Bittrich uh, was much more civilized than most of the other SS um, commanders. There's no doubt about that. He actually came from the Wehrmacht and was not uh, was not sort of just an SS officer in that particular sense. Uh, and so he permitted that particular truce uh, for the handing over of wounded and so forth. Um, and Hitler, uh, if he had found out, would have been absolutely apoplectic. Yes. Um, yeah. So no, that, that there is an element of truth, truth in it, um, and. Um, but, I mean, it, it was, to a large degree, hoping that they could sort of slightly clean up their reputation. Yeah. Well, the, the overall German commander was uh, General Model, wasn't mm. it, who, he, who was a fanatical Nazi, even though yes. he wasn't in the SS. In fact, didn't he blow his brains out at the end of the war because he... Yes, uh, he did, yeah, exactly. Couldn't bear he, to surrender? He couldn't bear to surrender, yeah. Mm, mm. Um, uh, what, if anything, did it achieve <laughs> in terms of the... Allied, the Western Allied strategy against Nazi Germany in the Second World War? Well, it didn't really achieve anything because the trouble was that that area between uh, the River Waal, this is between Nijmegen, really, and Arnhem, was dead ground in the sense that it was a uh, floodplain. Um, they were dug in there. There was a sort of a battle which continued uh, with sort of artillery firing in both directions. It was a stalemate. Um, and in fact, it lost quite a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, with the British Second Army sort of bogged down in that particular position. Um, others had suggested to Montgomery that they, he shouldn't try to attack north across the Rhine at Arnhem. He should have tried to attack uh, eastwards across the Rhine at Wesel, uh, which is where, finally, he did cross the Rhine, but not until the following spring, not until um, the following March. So, um, you know, it was a, a lot of time was wasted, and it was a, a cold, muddy, very cold and nasty winter, uh, which they all endured, but without any... Uh, with, very, with very little hope. And so uh, you cannot say, I mean, people quite often ask, oh, how many, how, did, did, um, did, for example, the ultra uh, intercepts, you know, shorten the war? Um, did this lengthen the war? It's impossible to tell. We've still got to be realistic and understand, I think, that the, the, the war was more or less decided on the Eastern Front. Uh, mm. It much more depended on what the Soviet armies were doing. 80% just over 80% of all of the German casualties occurred on the Eastern Front. Um, and that was where the war was going to be decided. 
But the great irony there, of course, was that if the Americans hadn't been so generous by giving the Red Army uh, more, um, just on half a million military vehicles, um, the Americans would still have got to Berlin much, much before the, before the Russians, because it absolutely transformed the mobility of the Red Army. Right. <laughs> but that's one of the paradoxes of the Second World War. After Arnhem, the British and the Americans still had another um, eight or so months of, uh, of, of, of defeating Hitler, fighting side by side. How mm. did Arnhem affect their relationship? Uh, it certainly didn't rest help of the war? it, but no. it was much more after the Ardennes when Montgomery tried to claim that he'd won the whole of the battle, um, that Anglo American relations really took a nosedive. How did that manifest itself? Well, he, there was this, um, uh, on, in January 1945, uh, Montgomery insisted on having this um, press conference. Um, and he said, oh, I really want to sort of, you know, praise Eisenhower and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> but the press conference very quickly became one of Monty claiming that he'd won the Battle of the Ardennes. Um, and you can imagine how much that angered um, the Americans who'd fought the Battle of the Ardennes. Um, <laughs> and um, in fact, very soon afterwards, just before the Alta Conference, uh, General Marshall had to tell uh, Churchill that none of his generals would ever serve under Montgomery again under any circumstances. And the British were sidelined up to North Germany in the uh, in the advance into Germany, and while the Americans did the sort of main operation, so the British were completely sidelined as a result afterwards. Goodness. Mm. Um, Anthony, um, hundreds of, uh, in, in the book, um, hundreds of fascinating anecdotes, so many voices. I just want to talk to a little bit of your, your of how you put the book together. Where did you... Where did you dig where nobody has, has, has dug before to give such a comprehensive picture of this engagement? Well, it's a question one's got to do the work at the coalface and the coalface of the archives. Uh -huh. um, here we had five nationalities involved. We had obviously British, American, German, Dutch, uh, and also Polish. Um, and, you know, you've got to tackle all the archives. Now, obviously, I don't speak Dutch, but I had a great Dutch friend, and we worked together in the Dutch archives. But I'm sure your Polish is fluent, though. My Polish is... <laughs> no, I'm afraid my Polish is absolutely not fluent, but I yes. had already worked with um, um, a great friend who was, who's uh, uh, worked in the um, military archives in Warsaw, and uh, so we worked together on the Polish uh, archives and um, also in, because the, the bulk of them, funny enough, were in London still because of the uh, Sikorsky Institute and so forth. Uh -huh. And of course the American archives, which have a fabulous amount of material there. It's purely a question of, you know, if you've got to be able to spend the time in the archives and, um, and then it is a question of the marshalling process um, of getting, getting the material in, in place. Um, there's no point doing yet another book on an, the same subject which everybody else has done if you're going to be coming up and using the same material and the same sources every single time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, one of the reasons why I decided to do this particular book was that I've been rather irritated by previous books which had very, very little about the suffering of the Dutch civilians. So it was vital to do all of the Dutch archives, uh, of which there is a phenomenal amount of material. Um, mm -hmm. of private diaries and letters and so forth. Um, and um, also, you know, to really make sure that you've covered the other archives and the all the other countries. Mm. Um, otherwise, there's no point doing mm. it. Um, next year, oh, no, not, not it's, sorry, it's 75, it's the 75th anniversary of Arnhem. In September, yeah. Uh, it's 75 years since the war finished. I, I'm, I'm reminded of that... Um, of that uh, quote by who, an, a British historian whose name escapes me on a television chat show on the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution when he was asked, how do we, looking back, assess the French Re Revolution, to which is, his answer was, well, it's a little early to tell. I wonder if the Second World War is going to resonate down through history as that event did. What do you think? Well, I'm always intrigued. I mean, for example, when the book came out in, in Holland on Arnhem, um, the Dutch journalists interviewing me all sort of said, almost shaking their heads in disbelief, why is it that the Second World War seems to be even more popular as a subject or fascinating as a subject uh, today than even, say, 20 years ago? Yes. And it's a very good question. And I mean, uh, I think there are a number of reasons that one can point to. Um, I think that it was a question of the fact that the real element, the real 
central point, core, if you like, of all human drama is moral choice. And actually, the Second World War offered more moral choice than almost any other period in history, whether your country was occupied, whether you had the courage or the um, generosity to shelter Jews or hide members of the resistance or whatever it might be, um, if you were in an occupied country. But even, even those, or all those involved in the Second World War, had to face major um, I think, questions uh, of that sort in them, themselves. And also because we've been living in this sort of a period of peace which has gone on for so long, um, whether, it will not on, whether it will in the future is a different matter, um, but mm. this period of peace where we lived in a post-military environment, a um, health and safety environment, um, mm. and um, I think people were fascinated by the question, and still are, of, you know, what would I have done? Would I have had the courage to do, to do this or to take that decision or whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, and I think that's why it still still has the sort of resonance that it does. Have we seen the last of the days when massed men in uniforms will line up on battlefields in divisional strength or is warfare change forever Well, we now, have in a way, partly because armies are so much smaller yes. uh, than they were. And I'm afraid the terrifying uh, consequence of that is um, not what necessarily what you'd expect. It means that now nobody can really, no army in the world is big enough to form a front line. And therefore, <laughs> no, seriously. And no, but, the, the, but the consequence of that is urban warfare. Even the Swiss army is preparing for urban warfare because that is going to be the focus of combat in the future. And it's terrifying because obviously it's going to involve civilians even more than in the past. You've only got to look at the lessons that were taken out of the battle for Mosul. Um, I mean, and I've been involved in conferences, of the British Army conferences, on the whole subject of urban warfare, um, where what they found actually is that, is that the lessons from the Battle of Mosul are exactly the same in most cases as the Battle of Stalingrad. I mean, this mm. is why we were doing all of these different conferences on the subject. And I'm afraid that actually is likely to be the future of warfare if we happen to see it. Just to the future, Anthony, but before we, and we will get to some questions uh, from you, ladies and gentlemen, in a moment. Uh, Europe, as you said, has enjoyed this extraordinary, uh, uh, for the first time in centuries, the notion of uh, England and France and Germany going to war with one another is absolutely unthinkable. But I don't need to remind you that things are changing. As, as an historian with an eye to the long game, do you um, follow, the, do you, do you, do you, do you um, uh, agree with this uh, school of thought that there is a disintegration, a kind of a, a new tribalism uh, uh, coming into Europe? I'm afraid so, yes. Um, history never repeats itself, you know. <laughs> there, there can be resemblances. That's a cliche, be, is it? Well, it, no, no, it's, it's an important one because um, you find all too often that sort of politicians, particularly American and British ones, I'm afraid, wanting to sound Rooseveltian or Churchillian, uh, will often invoke the Second World War, like George Bush trying to uh, compare 9-11 to Pearl Harbor. I mean, it's disastrous when they start doing that because yeah. the consequences can be so appalling. Yeah, well, that they're turning a terrorist attack into a war. <laughs> yes, precisely. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 I know. Um, but what we are, we are going to see, I think, is uh, we're going to see, we're, we are entering a very dangerous period um, from the point of view that we are seeing, A, a lack of confidence in democracy. Um, I, I mentioned that in Britain, um, we, the latest poll showed that just over 50%, 53% apparently, uh, are looking towards, want to have a strong leader prepared, willing to break the rules. Um, oh, nice. In Germany, it's over 40%. Uh, Sweden is about the lowest in Europe with only 30%. But I mean, that gives you an idea of the frustrations, the fears. What is happening is that obviously the extremes, whether extreme left or extreme right, and the two of them are actually joining up in the case of the Gilets Jaunes and in some of the cases of the sort of protest groups in, in Britain, where you get extreme left and extreme right. Now, this was nothing like this happened in the 30s. So we are in a different era, a, a, a completely different game, if you like, yes. uh, in that particular way. And what frightens me is that with global warming, we've only got to see another wave of um, emigration of uh, refugees, basically, coming north from Africa or from the Middle East. 
And, you know, the European lifeboat is actually going to find itself commanded by the extreme right um, right. on anti-immigration. So I think we're into a, 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 in democratic terms, we're into a very, very dangerous era in in the course of the next few years. And on that cheery note, without even mentioning the B word once, um, (laughs) I'd like to, I'm going to thank Anthony (laughs) properly later, but please, for our our wonderful guest, Sir Anthony B. Board tonight, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, oh, uh, I should have got this on a few minutes ago, but we'd love some questions from you. Yes, sir. Um, Sir Anthony, um, I'm actually, I become terribly enraged when I come across some details of Spear and the situation with him where he virtually um, died very comfortably at 82. And I'm wondering, as a, as a historian, and the facts that you have to go through to write these books and so on, whether there's been enough, well, work done on the slave labour dimension, Mr. Spear with the rockets, and et cetera? Mm. Um, that's my first question. Oh, right. Well, I think, can we do uh, just one question at a time? One, I think what one, that, 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 that's a great question, sir, Anthony. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of work has been done, uh, certainly, and uh, the way that Speer managed to get away with it. Speer was brilliant uh, at his trial, uh, the way that he came up with a sort of preemptive confession when every other Nazi uh, was trying to pretend they'd done nothing wrong. Uh, Speer said yes, yes, and confessed. Um, and as a result, he never was sentenced to death. It was only to uh, um, a relatively, comparatively short period of Im- imprisonment. Um, and he managed to basically to bluff his way. I think he persuaded himself that uh, somehow he hadn't been involved with all of this. But you are absolutely right. I mean, in terms of the slave labor uh, in the um, tunnels, making the V2 rockets, and uh, all of the people working for him uh, were treated as badly as any uh, uh, concentration camp uh, prisoner, and we we don't know exactly, but we've got some reasonable statistics, I think, on exactly how many people died uh, of starvation, overwork, and execution uh, working for Speer in the um, uh, in, in 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 his underground factories. What I think has always been very striking was the way that when Speer was interrogated by American officers just after the end of the war. The one thing that Speer was almost offended by was the way he said, you know, history, he said, history always emphasizes terminal events. And this meant that Speer was um, regretful of the fact that the early achievements, as he saw it, of national socialism, uh, building the motorways, the auto auto, uh, route, uh, (laughs) uh, and um, getting rid of unemployment in Germany, uh, he felt all of these were going to be forgotten. Um, They're only going to remember the squalor of the collapse of the Third Reich. Well, actually, I think he was 100% wrong, because I think nothing uh, is more indicative of a regime uh, than the manner of its downfall, and nothing could have been more grotesque uh, than the downfall of the Third Reich. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm. Why haven't you written anything on Wilhelm, the Kaiser? There's absolutely nothing about the Kaiser. He just went to Norway after the war. No, uh, Holland, to to the Netherlands, yeah. I won't, that doesn't matter. Why hasn't there been anything written about the absolute horrors he inflicted all around it. Have you ever sort of thought of doing some work on that? Well, no, I, I've, I've left the First World War to other, to other, other, other historians. <laughs> um, but yes, it's certainly true. I mean, what we, under, we tend to forget about and we, uh, is the fact that, for example, the Kaiser, during the First World War, uh, wanted to starve all the Russian uh, prisoners of war to death. Uh, so, um, you know, shall we say there was a certain... Um, a certain ideological um, basis uh, for the uh, development of Nazism. Uh, I think that we should have seen um, the development of Nazism perhaps at an earlier stage when one remembers elements of that. But but the Kaiser um, was let off uh, in that particular way. Uh, And he uh, just basically Mm. spent the rest of his life in very comfortable retirement. Mm. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it's very enjoyable, uh, Mr. Beaver. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any viewpoint on the um, rehabilitation and employment of um, Nazi scientists and war criminals after the Second World War, such as um, uh, 
the man who uh, headed NASA and uh, other employment von of uh, <laughs> what we have, Vern von Braun and other <laughs> war criminals who were rehabilitated and employed by uh, the West after the war. Uh, what your perspective is on that sort of thing? Thank and you. on the Japanese side, I mean, that was what was so terrifying. Was really? The, yeah. Oh, oh okay. yes. The Americans, you know, Think Unit 731 and the Harbin, which were they were carrying out the most appalling uh, experiments on uh, prisoners, on Chinese, but also on certain number of uh, Allied prisoners of war, um, almost as bad as what was carried out at Dachau and by Mengele. Um, he was let off uh, by MacArthur, um, so that American, if you like, American military science, if one could call it that, uh, could profit from their discoveries on um, basically the sort of the torture and the killing and the uh, mm. experiments carried out on, on um, prisoners during the war. Uh, the same thing happened very much uh, with um, scientists, German scientists, at the end of the Second World War in, in Europe. Uh, there was a, an absolute uh, obscene scramble between um, the Russians and or the Soviets and the Western Allies in grabbing all of the scientists they could get hold of just in case they could sort of learn something in what was obviously going to be the new Cold War following the hot war. Paperclip, they called it, an Operation Paperclip. Paperclip, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. was Operation Paperclip. Um, you know, there was also Operation Borodino, which was the uh, Soviet attempt to build an atomic bomb. Uh, and there they were desperate to get the German, uh, not just to get the German scientists, even though the German scientists had been following a false lead on their attempt to get the atomic bomb. Uh, but they were also trying to get all the uranium. Um, and actually, most, a lot of it had been transferred down to the Black Forest without them realizing. Uh, so actually, the French got hold of it. Actually, the second uh, bomb um, dropped on Japan uh, was mainly made out of um, uranium, uh, Belgian, Euro well, sorry, uranium from the Belgian Congo, which the Germans had stolen from the Belgians, and which then the Americans got back from the Germans, um, was <laughs> basically contributed to um, the second bomb on um, uh, Nagasaki. That's your next book. Yes. What a ripper. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not doing the Far East. <laughs> uh, I'll ask you that in a moment. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, who, in your opinion, was the best general in World War II? Well, a lot of people have sort of said Manstein on the German side, and there's no doubt about it, he was, if you like, a strategic and tactical genius in many ways. Uh, that doesn't mean that he was an admirable man. I mean, most people suspect, actually, he was, uh, his real name was Levinsky, and um, most people thought that he was probably Jewish, but it was hidden. Uh, and he actually, he came out with more anti-Semitic orders to his troops than almost anybody else. Uh, but he was probably, I would have said, probably the greatest tactician or strategist um, of the Second World War. Um, in terms of impressive ones, um, I would have said very much uh, General Bill Slim in Burma. Ah, that's what who, I would have said who too. Was, who was loved <laughs> by his troops quite rightly. Um, one, one and one also, I think I think Nimitz uh, was an, an admirable, uh, admiral. an admirable admiral. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't a bad phrase, but anyway, um, he was a very impressive, impressive man. Um, he was not one of those uh, egotists. I mean, it was unbelievable the way you've got to remember that many of these commanders have been totally uh, ignored. They'd, nobody had ever heard of them when the war started, mm. and suddenly they were being treated as film stars. And for some of them, it completely turned their heads. And um, they started to see themselves as, uh, uh, they, they, they saw suddenly, they saw leadership uh, as a form of charisma now. Mm. And um, with all of these journalists and um, uh, movie uh, real, I mm. mean, newscast mm. uh, uh, teams there, uh, one of the worst, apart from MacArthur, who of course was notorious um, for his uh, egotism, um, was actually General Mark Clark in Italy, who oh. had a team of over 50 um, in his public relations things to make sure that all photographs were taken from his best side because he was very proud of his Roman profile and he was determined to capture Rome. So his staff officers started referring to him, uh, referring to him as Marcus Aurelius Clarkus. <laughs> <laughs> so most of us here read your books. What do you read? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have an absolute binge on fiction, <laughs> on novels, <laughs> as soon as I've finished a book and delivered it and all the rest of it. Uh, because when I'm actually working on a book, I really am reading 
books on that subject. Uh, I'm not like my dear friend Max Hastings, I know not necessarily sometimes the most popular person in Australia, but my dear friend Max, who is, has that sort of mind, which I can only admire and envy, where he can actually switch his mind from one thing to another in a matter of minutes. I, I'm an old stick in the mud, and I have to sort of get into mode and mood and all the rest of it. Um, and if I'm working on a particular subject, and the next subject is the Russian Civil War, I will only read about the Russian Civil War. Um, and because I find that, you know, if I then have to go and do a conference on a previous book, it takes me days afterwards before I can really get back into it. Uh, I wish and I was better in that way. It's a lot of darkness to keep in your head, too, Anthony, yeah. especially, I mean, writing the, the, the Berlin book. My goodness me. I, 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 <laughs> did it, does it haunt you at night when you're working on it? I mean, some well, of the stories you uncovered are, compl are yeah. ghastly, particularly No, no, no they were. And, I mean, there is that uh, hope thing. I remember Max and I had a, shall we say, a fairly acrimonious debate with Neil Ferguson when he accused us of writing war pornography and being controversial. And we thought that, well, frankly, Neil, being controversial coming from you, that's a bit rich. Um, <laughs> but it is true. I mean, some of the stuff, I mean, particularly you were right on the Berlin book, some of the stuff was so appalling um, that you, you felt even you couldn't actually include it. Um, I was yes. very lucky. I had Catherine Meridale who went through the material and advised me. But you do need, you're so close to the material, you can hardly judge sort of, you know, what, what are the limits of horror um, mm. that mm. you can include. Mm. Oh uh, dear, I see a flashing light in front of us. Well, this gentleman has yes, been waiting. Quite, one, one more we, the and, very and, last and you'll one, be our yeah. last. Thank you. Um, you've told us about a battle that the Allies obviously totally, you know, um, messed up. <laughs> messed up in uh, on the Western Front. Are there equivalent battles that the Russians messed up? Oh God! I mean, the <laughs> the cruelty, the cruelty, the ruthlessness. When um, the great G Russian counterattack, Soviet counterattack at Stalingrad, Operation Uranus was being uh, organised, they decided to have a. Um, a diversion on the central part of the front called Operation Mars. And this gives you an idea of the total callousness of, Stalingrad, of Stalin himself. They sent uh, three armies into the attack with virtually no artillery support whatsoever. But worst of all, they deliberately passed the plans of the attack to the Germans in advance through a double spy, through a double agent called Demidov. Um, and all of this has been written about and described by the head of the NKVD special task section. Um, anyway, well, they having... Why? why did they do that? Well, so that the Germans would not move any troops down to the south um, to reinforce the Stalingrad front. They were trying to pin them in the center. And they sacrificed 246,000 casualties, which was more than all of the Allied casualties for D-Day and the whole of the Battle of Normandy up until uh, August, <laughs> uh, purely so as to create a diversion. Well, I think that gives you a pretty good idea of the brutality and the uh, total pitilessness uh, of the Soviet Union during that particular period. And the Beavors Arnhem, The Battle for the Bridges. This is the book. Would you please thank our distinguished guest tonight, Sir Anthony Beavor. Michael, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.